want you to know how much I appreciate the invitation for being here. Uh, I do count this congregation as very faithful to the Lord. Um, your efforts in trying to evangelize is greatly appreciated. I appreciate the elders and their love for the truth. I appreciate Jeff and his wife and uh, their endurance and diligence to the cause of Jesus Christ. Um, you know, the thing that really strikes me about them is when I think about folks who have a good heart. Man, you've got good hearts. And I know that you're appreciative of them being here and working with you. Uh, do everything you can to hold his hands up to, to uh, proclaim the gospel because he is definitely uh, involved in the greatest work in all the world. And that is work of the church. There is no greater work that we can be involved in because it's talking about... We're referring to the things that are of a spiritual nature that last forever, and that is the soul. Uh, so I'm grateful that you're here. I'm encouraged by your presence. And I want you to know that the things that I'll be saying today, uh, I promise you I have uh, uh, coming from a heart of love and concern for the souls of, of the whole world, uh, definitely for this congregation. And I uh, would ask you not to take my word for anything. I want you to check me out, make sure that the things that I'm telling you is from God, from the book. And if it is, uh, believe it. If it's not, reject it. Because uh, only God has the truth about those things. I do want to mention uh, a couple of things. Uh, Monday night, uh, tomorrow night, uh, at Cherokee I'll be speaking. I don't know if uh, you should receive that flyer. I uh, would love to see if you have that opportunity. In fact, that, that goes uh, several days. I'll just be speaking tomorrow night. But uh, it's great work that they're doing as well. Uh, tonight, I hope that you'll be able to, tonight, 2 p.m., should I say. Uh, we do the same thing on the first Sunday. But uh, I'm going to be talking about the home. Uh, I've already told you that uh, as, a, uh, as a high school teacher, man, do I see problems in our society. And probably uh, there's a few uh, professions out there, and definitely one is in the field of education. You really get to see what reality is and what's going on in the world. And... Uh, there is such a need for the truth and, and lessons on the home. And I thought that I would uh, present a lesson. I hope that you'll be able to be here. If you want to be uh, better mamas and daddies, uh, better husbands and wives, better grandparents, I uh, hope that you'll be able to stay for that. I want to show you what the Bible says about that. I know those things are presented here from time to time. But I think they're so important that that's what I chose to talk about. <clears throat> I have, uh, let me find my presenter here. Uh, It's not all. It's hard to do. Oops. There we are. I will get it. I want to talk to you about the subject of God's plan of redemption. And God's plan of redemption, obviously, because it's so important, should seize the attention of every single person because it impacts every person. In fact, uh, we're talking about saving people from the consequences of sin. There is not, and you're welcome to correct me after this lesson is over and show me that, I've, uh, that there's something else, but there's nothing more important uh, as far as a topic that could be discussed than the, than the plan of salvation. Not a more vital theme that we could discuss. And so what I've done for ease in remembering and understanding this lesson chosen seven points, and I have began each one of those with the letter P to help us maybe understand and, and aid at least in what I am talking about. And the first thing that I want to talk about is the problem, the problem. And we know that we are plagued in our society with great social problems. I think about the violence that's going on in the United States, or the crime, and the, I think about the immorality, the promiscuity. I think about what I'm going to talk about this evening, the breakdown of the home. I think about mental health. Uh, I think we're seeing more and more mental health problems because people are trying to deal with their problems and they're not dealing with them in the proper way. I believe the Bible has the answer to those things. But when I think about all these social problems, I, I believe that our society's concern is only from, and I'm going to use a word I don't usually use, but only from a pragmatic standpoint and not a spiritual one. Now what I mean by pragmatic, let me give you this illustration. 
Let's take the matter of teenage pregnancy. Uh, never mind about the fornication that caused it. It seems that our society is more concerned with the financial and the emotional burden and the educational limit, limitations that it causes. In other words, uh, from our society standpoint, it's not very practical, not very pragmatic, uh, because it costs us money. It costs us money. Uh, and and I'm, I fear that if it did not so impact us economically, most would not care. But you see, Christians have a deeper concern. Christians have a moral concern. Christians have a spiritual concern. You see, money, money will not solve our social problems. In fact, it seems like the richer we become, the worse uh, our problems are becoming. Money's not the answer. I think about education as a teacher. It seems like the more money we throw at education, the worse it becomes. Uh, some, money's not the answer. You see, there's a greater problem plaguing human beings than economics. And, and we've tried on our own to solve this, this, universal, this universal malady, if you will, but to no avail. Uh, others have tried to ignore it, pretending, but it doesn't exist. But they have failed, and it just mounts up more and more problems. And this problem that I'm talking about was a problem with the first man and continues to be a problem with every person thereafter. And I think you already know what the problem is. The problem is sin. What are we going to do about it? Now I want to talk about the universal nature of the problem. And, and I want to emphasize the universal nature of it by giving you a few uh, historical statistical things. You know, so, something that's certainly fresh in our minds. Let's talk about uh, COVID. COVID deaths. COVID deaths. Now I got this information from the CDC website. Uh, let's talk about the folks who have died from COVID. In the United States... So far, 0.3% of the population has died of COVID. 0.3, not 3, but 0.3. That's about 3 people out of every 1,000. Uh, globally, I looked at the global statistics, and uh, it's less than that. Uh, then the United States, 0.08%. That's 8 people out of 10,000. Now, think about... All we hear a lot about it and think about the impact of it. And don't misunderstand, it's definitely impacted us. No question about that. But how universal is it uh, as far as just death? Now, it definitely has affected other people, other issues. But just as far as death is concerned, really not as big maybe as, as I thought. Let me up it a little bit. Deaths caused by Adolf Hitler. You remember your history. As a result of his rise to power... His rule is estimated to be over 50 million people. Deaths. 50 million people. And that would include soldiers on both sides, as well as civilians. In fact, more civilians were killed in World War II as a result of that than, uh, than, than soldiers. Now, so, so what does over 50 million, what's the percentage of that? That's only 2.5% of the population of the world. 2.5%. Uh, so it's bigger, but it's still not as universal as sin. Uh, let's go on back further in history. In the 14th century, 14th century, you remember that, don't you? <laughs> that would go on uh, 60 million people died in Europe from the Black Death. Now that's more universal. It's fairly universal, uh, but still not as sin, because that's only, that was only, again, this is estimated, that was only 14% of the population. 14% of the population. You know, here we are. We're approaching 8 billion people in our world. That's, that's how we're growing. You know, our number one problem, as we think about that, even though it's a problem, but our number one problem is not the physical necessities. In other words, how we will feed those people, how we will shelter those people. Again, the number one problem that affects every single soul is sin. And it is global. In the early chapters of the book of Romans, if you'll turn your Bibles to Romans 3, are designed to stress this point that, that all people, uh, whether Jew or Gentile, are under sin. In fact, in Romans 1, the Apostle Paul, really, you know, 
one of the main things he's doing in Romans 1, he's saying, listen, the Gentiles are guilty of sin. And then number 2, chapter 2, you've got the Jews that are guilty of sin. But then in chapter 3, he combines them. And he says stuff like this, verse 9. He says, what then? Are we better than they? No, in no wise, for we have before proved both Jews and Gentiles that they are all under sin. As it is written, quoting from the Old Testament, there is none righteous, no, not one. Now, that tells me that the universal nature of sin is a big deal. In fact, we all know this verse, in verse 23, when Paul says, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Or John, John agrees with him, the Apostle John, in 1 John chapter 5 and verse 19, when he says, the whole world lieth in wickedness. And so again, what's my point? The universal nature of sin and the great commission to go into all the world, Matthew 28, Mark 16, Luke 24, Acts 1. The great commission really shows how universal it is. It's so universal, we've got to go into all the world. That's how important this is. And amazingly, the early church this did just that. Colossians 1.6 and 1.23. And so, sin is a universal problem, no doubt about that. And, and don't miss this. Even though it's a universal problem, sin is a personal problem. It is our personal problem because it has personal implications and consequences. Uh, it's personal. You know, I do not uh, inherit the sin of my father, nor the sin of his father, nor Adam's sin. And I don't pass it down to my children. There's, there are several passages that we can allude to which would prove that, like Ezekiel chapter 18, verses 18 through 24, especially verse 20, where Ezekiel writes that the soul who sins, it shall die. The son shall not bear the iniquity of the father, nor the father to the son. So it's not something that is, is, is uh, genetic. Uh, it's, it's of such a nature that it cannot be inherited. Uh, 1 John chapter 3, verse 4 tells me that sin is a transgression of the law. But here's the point. It was because of this problem that Jesus had to come uh, into this world and die for us. You know that. Uh, John chapter 12, verse 47 and 48, listen to what Jesus says. If anyone hears my words and does not believe, I do not judge him, for I did not come to judge the world, but to save the world. Jesus didn't come in the world to judge the world. That's not the first, that was not the purpose of his first coming. Now that is the purpose of his second coming. Uh, he goes on to say, He who rejects me and does not receive my words has one, or that which judges him. The word that I have spoken will judge him in the last day. There's judgment. But that's why Jesus came the first time. He wants to save people from this terrible malady, from this thing that we call sin. So the first P as we think about the plan of salvation is essential for us to understand what the problem is. The problem is sin. And God is a holy God. God is a holy God and He cannot tolerate sin in His presence. Now, I may not like that, but it doesn't change that. God is in control. He's the potter of the clay. And uh, He is uh, offended by that thing. And so that caused Him because He is offended, but also because of His mercy, that we come to the second P in the plan of salvation, the person. And you know who that person is. That is Jesus Christ. He is the one who saves us. And that's the reason that we call Him Savior. Uh, just as the Samaritans came to realize, if you remember in John 4, remember the Samaritan woman, the woman at the well, and how uh, she left and went into the city after the conversation with, with uh, Jesus, and then these other people came and talked with Jesus, and, and this is what those men said uh, to the woman. He says, now we believe, we believe in Him, because of... Uh, not because of what you said, but we have heard him ourselves, and we know that this is indeed the Christ, the Savior of the world. That's exactly right. They, were, they concluded properly. They understood sin. They understood that sin is a universal problem, and as a result of that, we need a universal Savior. 1 John chapter 4 and verse 14, we have seen, John says, and do testify that the Father sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. Because it's a universal problem. It's a worldly problem. Now, it's very important. I really want you to pay attention. By examining the work of Jesus Christ from a spiritual and a biblical basis, we learn that Jesus Christ is distinctly qualified to be 
your Savior. Uh, why is that? Well, there are some really profound reasons. Uh, I am amazed at inspiration, at, at divine revelation, at how God has worked this thing out in the perfect manner. And I want to share with you some of those ways. And it, and it, it really is challenging. It's challenging to my mind. Uh, it's, I believe it's challenging to all human minds. But, but there is the effort by God to explain some of these things to us of why Jesus was the answer, why he was the perfect uh, individual to do this. And so let's talk about that. Why is he qualified to be our Savior? Well, first of all, because he is the only means of access to the Father. You remember John 14 and verse 6, when Jesus says, No man comes to the Father but by me. Friends, there is no, no other access to God. Now, why do I need access to God? So I can be forgiven. I've got to go to God. I've got to, to uh, beg His mercy and His forgiveness, to, uh, uh, to be able to access His forgiveness. And Jesus says, you've got to come through me. And so He is the only means of access to the Father. That's why He is qualified to be the Savior. Secondly, if you'll see there on the screen, He was the world's only perfect human. The only perfect human. Remember what he challenged the Jews with in John 8, 46? He says, which of you convicteth me of sin? Which of you can show me uh, uh, where I violated the law of God? Well, they couldn't do it. Uh, and you think about Paul's statement in Hebrews 4, verse 15, uh, whenever uh, Paul says that he was tempted in all points like as we are, yet without sin. And John calls him in 1 John chapter 2, 1, Jesus Christ the righteous. And he truly was the only person that was righteous because he kept the law perfectly. It's really amazing. I wish I had time to talk about. Now, now, so you see, he's the only perfect human. Why is that important? Because think about this. So we needed a Savior. We'd be hell-bound without one. And if he would have sinned, then he would have needed a Savior. It's important that he was perfect. It's important that he resisted temptation. Not in a superhuman way. Uh, he did that in the same manner that we can. But if he would have sinned, if he would have succumbed to temptation, then he would have needed a Savior. And he who needs a Savior cannot be a Savior. And that's why it was essential for him to be perfect, vital, necessary. See, a perfect man sinned in the garden, right? Adam, Adam and Eve. And it would take a perfect man to take care of that sin. That's exactly what Jesus did. And he was the perfect substitute for our life. That's what he is. He was the perfect sacrifice. And what that did is it satisfies God's infinite justice and holiness to pay for man's sin. And that's exactly the King James word propitiation. And that's interesting this morning I... I was watching uh, the good news. I don't know if you got to watch it this this morning on the uh, Fox Network, uh, uh, Fox Channel. But uh, one of those brethren, one of those gospel preachers, was talking about this very word propitiation. Man, that's worth the price of sitting down and listening to it. It's so good. That's exactly right. Okay, Romans three twenty five, First John two, uh, First John four uses this word propitiation. God was satisfied at that atonement. And it's a really, really good word that, that I think the more we understand it, the more we appreciate God. And so, Jesus is qualified to be Savior because He's the only perfect sermon. And the third, or, or person, and the third one uh, that we see here is that He's qualified because He's, he's the only mediator between God and man. Uh, 1 Timothy 2, 4 and 5. Only one that God would accept. Uh, Paul makes that argument. There's one man. Okay, there's Christ Jesus, one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. So what had happened, what that implies is, uh, we use this term, there was a breach between God and man. And that breach, that division, was caused by sin. I think about uh, a common passage we hear, Isaiah 59, 1 and 2, your sins have separated you from God. That's exactly right. Now Paul would use the word, the King James would use the word enmity in Romans 5. Enmity. Kind of like enemy, because it kind of kind of means the same thing, but there is a difference. The word enmity means hostility. And so when sin occurred, we were severed. Our fellowship was severed. That began in the garden. You go back to Genesis 3. 
And you see that very well. And so as a result, God would not accept man without a mediator. I mean, if we had time, we could talk about uh, a priest and the mediatorship in the Old Testament, how vital that was. And we learn from that. And we appreciate more and more what Jesus did. He's the only one that God would accept. And so, and he is qualified to be that mediator since he was no party of the offense. He was no part of that offense. And, uh, and so he was equally related to both parties that were involved. Think about that for a moment. Uh, he was related to God. He was the God-man. Uh, he was, that's what Jesus is, John 1.14. He is God in the flesh. Uh, that came as a result of the virgin birth. That's why we believe it's essential to believe that. And he was related to man. He had a human mother. Uh, we understand that. And so his father was divine. Uh, and there's no other way to accomplish this, to get the God-man into the world, uh, to do what he did, and to be this perfect mediator uh, uh, without being born of a woman. Okay? Again, God-man. Now these are, I know, listen, I know these are very profound and real points that take some digestion. But whenever you do, and you spend time thinking about these things and the implications of what uh, these New Testament writers are talking about, Man, it, it makes my life fuller and it makes me appreciate so much more God and what He did and how perfect and complete His plan is. See, this is important to understand. The problem with all other religions like Islam and Hinduism is they have no sufficient way to answer and deal with the problem of sin. You know, the religions of the world, again, Hinduism, Buddhism, Islam, they exist, certainly, and they exist due to two things. Because folks desire to seek the Creator, and they desire to deal with their sin problem. Trying to figure out all this misery and this mess that has been created. Now, not only are these religions an inferior way in dealing with sin compared to uh, Christianity, but they are entirely um, insufficient. Uh, they don't deal with sin in a manner in which both parties, God and man, become righteous or just, Romans 3, 25 and 26. Christianity stands alone on this issue. It's a really st strong argument that we can make with some of those folks if they would be willing to listen. And so, as we think about the plan of salvation, the scheme of redemption, it's important to know the problem. The problem is sin. It's important to know the person. The person is Jesus Christ. And it's important to understand the plan. And so this point really emphasizes man's part. Uh, God did his part. That's what Jesus Christ is. Uh, but we have a part to play as well. As well. Salvation is conditional. Uh, now many religious people have perverted this point. Uh, they don't understand fully what the Bible says. When we look at what the Bible teaches, the New Testament, we learn that there is a gospel plan of salvation that... that that mankind is responsible for doing something. They can't, they're just not passive. And, and we believe, and properly so, that the Bible teaches that in order to be saved, in order to be right with God, to have forgiveness, you've got to hear the gospel, you've got to believe it, you've got to confess Jesus as the Son of God, uh, you've got to be baptized, and I forgot repentance, didn't I? Hmm. That just proved to you I'm not perfect. Right? <laughs> I'll have to redo that. Uh, do not have repentance in there. I've just, uh, uh, but you get the point. Got to repent. Acts chapter eight and verse thirty-two. Let me tell you a little side note. Usually I would have caught that, but I see that right here in front of me. And uh, but you get the point. Now, uh, sometimes as you look at the five steps as properly given, even though these are not, uh, sometimes we're called five steppers in derision. Five, you five steppers. Well, that's all right because. I want to take the steps that God has given me to take. No more, no less. And, and really, whenever they call us in derision, uh, you five-steppers, it's really an objection, I think, to uh, us contending that there's a pattern for our salvation. That there is a rule, that there is a, there's something we must do. I want to mention a couple of false approaches to the plan, the plan of salvation. There are those who say this, who have this this philosophy, give me the man, not the plan. Give me the man, Jesus, and not the plan. Or just give me Jesus, not a bunch of ordinances, not a bunch of commands. Well, that may sound nice, but it's not what the Bible teaches. 
It is false. For I understand that I cannot know anything about the man without the plan. Without, without understanding what the Bible teaches, salvation cannot be obtained without obeying the words of the man. And so I learned that Jesus, <clears throat> alone and separate and apart from obedience to his plan, will not bring about salvation. And there's a number of passages we would use to prove that. Matthew 7, 21, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father which is in heaven. Does the will. In fact, the King James Version, I prefer the doeth the will, because even though we don't use that, that old English uh, ending, it has the idea of a continual action. A continual action. So we've got to continually do the will of, of, God, of God in heaven. So the plan is so important. So important. And I see that. Well, on the other hand, let's look at the opposite of that, of this false approach. We've got to, to understand that the plan without the man is meaningless. Since Jesus Christ makes the plan of salvation meaningful. Uh, and there's a number of passages that would show that. Here's one that we could look at in 1 Peter 3.21. Uh, the like figure whereunto even baptism doth also now save us. So there is man's part. So is it baptism alone? No, not the putting away the filth of the flesh. In other words, we're not just talking about getting in water and taking a bath. But there's a spiritual aspect, the answer of a good conscience toward God. And notice this, by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So I want you to notice that baptism, which is part of the plan, okay, saves by the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who is the man. So it's both parts are essential. One cannot be saved without the man and without the plan. Now that plan was given by the man in what we call the Great Commission. We look at these instances in the Gospel accounts of Matthew and Mark and Luke and we see Jesus giving the Great Commission. And when we examine that, Matthew's account uh, talks about teaching people and then baptizing them. And when you do that, you have a relationship with the Godhead. In other words, you baptize in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. That's to into you. That's how you get into them. So you think about teaching them and baptizing them. That's what Jesus said. Go into all the world and, and teach all nations. Mark's account says preaching plus belief plus baptism equals salvation. Luke's account, Luke 24, 47, preaching plus repentance equals remission of sins. Now, notice... Uh, doesn't include uh, everything a man must do or a person must do in, in, in these. We've got to take all that the Bible says. But this great commission was very significant. And you've got the plan before he ascends to the heavens, after he is resurrected from the dead, he gives this to his apostles and thus by extension the church. Uh, and that's what we understand. And so that commission, that very commission was executed, if you will, carried out in the book of Acts. That's what the book of Acts is about. We call it the book of conversions. That's right. Absolutely. The gospel was preached and that resulted in penitent believers confessing and being baptized. And friends, that resulted in having their sins remitted and, and they got salvation. They obtained salvation. And it was at baptism, that final act, that God added them to the church. And that brings us to the fourth P of salvation. And that is the place. You know, salvation, when we look at what God has written in His book, we learn that salvation has always been located in some place. It's always been located in some place. For instance, in Noah's case, salvation was where? Inside the ark, 1 Peter chapter 3. Uh, another example, in Exodus chapter 12, in Israel's case, in order for them not to be, their firstborn to be destroyed, uh, they had to put blood on the house. And so salvation, they had to be in the house with the blood on it. And as a result of that, uh, those firstborn were spared. Or in 2 Kings 5, again, another example where the Syrian general who was uh, struck with leprosy or who had leprosy, uh, in order for him to be healed of leprosy uh, from God through the prophet, we learned that Naaman had to go dip in the Jordan River seven times, 2 Kings 5. Uh, that's 
in the Jordan River was his salvation. We continue, we look at an example in the, in the New Testament. In John chapter 9, the blind man, remember him, how uh, he was to go wash in the pool of Siloam, and he would receive his sight. Well, friends, whenever we make that application with regard to our salvation, when Jesus Christ came and died and, and buried, was buried and rose and ascended, he located salvation in his church. And the greatness of the church is seen in that it is one of three divine institutions. There's only three divine organizations. Only three divine institutions. Uh, there is the home, there is civil government, Romans 13, and there is the church. Very essential. The most important institution uh, that we can be a part of. Now the Bible teaches that Jesus is the Savior of the body. Now what's the body? Ephesians 5.23. Ephesians 5.23 says that Jesus is the Savior of the body. What's the body? It's the church. If you look back in chapter 1 of Ephesians, verse 19 and 20, you'll see uh, that the church of, of Christ, the church of Jesus Christ, is the body, is His body. And so it is said in Ephesians 5.23 that He is the Savior of the body. That's what He saves. He saves the body, the church. We learn in Acts chapter 2 on the day of Pentecost, whenever those people who were guilty, some of which of killing Jesus, they asked what they did to be saved. Peter told them, and they believed at that point, what men and brethren, what shall we do? Acts 2 37. They already believed. Peter told them to repent and be baptized for the remission of their sins. Okay? And then we learn in the last verse of that chapter, Acts 2, verse 47, that the Lord added the saved to the church. Now, who are the saved? Those who got remission of sins. And so where are the, where are the saved in Acts 2? When the, the birthday of the church, where are the saved? They're in the church, friends. There are no saved outside the church. There are no saved outside the church. That's not my opinion. That's what the Bible teaches. When you examine this with honest heart, you see that that is the case. And, and here's another passage. I would ask you, let's examine this a little closer. Turn your Bibles to Ephesians 2, please. Ephesians 2. This is a very, very significant uh, couple of statements that the Apostle Paul uh, talks about with regard to the church. Listen to what he says. Now this gets my attention. Listen, I want to go to heaven. I know that in order for me to go to heaven, I must have my sins forgiven. And the only way my sins can be forgiven is through the atonement of Jesus Christ and, and my obedience to His will. I understand that. Now, and, and so passages like this get my attention. Listen to what uh, Paul writes. He talks about, in verse 13 and 14, how Jesus is our peace, peace with God. And then he says in verse 15, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, or the hostility, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances, for to make in himself of twain one new man, so making peace. Now, the context of what's going on here is Paul is talking about the conflict between the circumcision and the uncircumcision. In other words, between the Jew and the Gentile. There's definitely a conflict. And uh, Paul wants folks to know that God brings them together in the church. And notice what he says in verse 16. He says, And that he, talking about Jesus, he might reconcile both unto God in one body by the cross, having slain the enmity thereby. Let's, let's pick that up, Paul, verse 16. Christ, we know what that's who he is. The word reconcile uh, suggests that uh, two people or two parties were at odds with each other. That's what the word enmity has to do with. What called what caused that hostility? Sin. Well, that he might reconcile both. Notice this, reconcile both, both Jew and Gentile, unto God. Unto God, uh, that's what we want. That's what every single human pe being needs to understand. In order for us to be, re to be right with God, we've got to be reconciled unto God. Where does that take place? I wouldn't know if the Bible didn't tell me. It says, in one body. In one body. Now what is the body? Well, if you go back to chapter 1, and you see uh, in verse 22 and 23, we're told that the body is the church. So reconciliation to God, I don't know he's talking about Jew and Gentile, but you're either in one class or the other. Okay, I don't know that, and there may be, 
couldn't prove it anyways. There may be somebody who uh, would claim Jewish heritage. I don't know. I think most of us are Gentiles. But there is reconciliation, yeah, Jew and Gentile, both, okay, unto God, where? In one body, in one church. Now, what church is that talking about? Well, I've got to look at the Bible and see. The only one that existed since Pentecost. That's the church. That's the body I've got to be a part of. That's what I want to be involved in. And, and let me remind you, that takes place by the cross. Uh, that's what we've got to give attention to. So when I, when I think about salvation being located in, in some place, uh, and I learned in the New Testament that Jesus located salvation in His body, in His church, and I see the proof of that in these passages before you, that gets my attention. I want to be a member of that church, that body. How do I do that? I've got to get in the book. I'm going to see what that body is. Now, I don't want to not say this point. This is very important. Let's talk about the purpose. The fifth P of salvation. What is the purpose of salvation? Well, you know the answer. To save souls. Um, you know, the mission of Jesus Christ. I love this statement in Luke 19.10, this inspired statement. Jesus says, the Son of Man has come to seek and save that which is lost. Well, friend, that's exactly our mission. Now, I don't have the same job that Jesus did. Um, you know, if I were to die for people, that wouldn't necessarily count for anything because I'm an imperfect person. I'm guilty of sin. But Jesus, who gave his life, he came to seek <coughs> and save that which is lost. That's our mission, to try to get people directed to Jesus Christ. We have been saved, and this is important. It's going to face us on judgment, brethren. It's going to face me on judgment. It's going to face you on judgment. We have been saved to save. We have been one to one. Okay? We have been one to win. We have been taught to teach. I think about what Paul tells young Timothy in 2 Timothy 2 verse 2. That the thing that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. Friends, we have an obligation. We've been blessed tremendously. You know, that's what grace is, right? Uh, we, you know, if it weren't for the grace of God, we would not be saved. What is grace? Always, always liked what Brother Franklin Camp, who has long passed this life, Brother Camp, would, he had a, a unique way of defining things. And he would define grace in this manner. I'm not saying he's the only one that did that, but I've, I've heard him say it this way. He said, grace is getting what you don't deserve. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. You know, if I do what the Lord has said to be saved, I still don't deserve it. But by His grace and His mercy, uh, I receive that salvation. That's His promise. And so, I've been saved by the grace of God, and I want others to be saved by the grace of God. Now, I know you do too, and I know it's not easy, but we've got to be constantly praying and thinking about how we can evangelize wherever we're at, whether it, at, at, at the work. Listen, you got to be thinking about this. That's why we got to be praying every morning. You know, one of the prayers that I think that we ought to be praying is, Lord, use me to help influence others. I'm nothing. You're everything. I'm trying to do your will to the best that I can. But Lord, give me opportunity. Give me opportunity to learn. Give me opportunity to teach others that somehow, some way that I can have an impact upon someone. Friends, that's our purpose. That they might be saved. Not just to fill their bellies, although that's important but to save their soul. You know, that's exactly what our mission is. And we do that, we do that by carrying that great commission, by teaching our children. Man, you got to teach your children. By teaching our friends, by teaching anybody we can. It is, okay, it is, and I've already alluded to this, this purpose is the greatest mission the greatest work, the greatest endeavor, the greatest effort which a human being could ever hope to be involved in. Why? Because it's because it's attempting to save the most important thing that a human being possesses. You know what your important, most important possession is, don't you? It's not your car. It's not your truck. It's not your home. It's not your land. It's not your bank account. I know you know that. It's your soul. Because it's the only eternal thing that you possess. You know, it's a scary thing. It is a sobering thing. Do you realize that whenever you were conceived in your mother's womb, okay, that God imparted unto you a spirit, an eternal 
soul. Man, that, that is sobering. And that soul will never cease to exist. It will live on and on and on and on. Somewhere, one of two places. That's why the human soul is the most valuable, most important aspect. And that's why the greatest purpose on the face of the earth. I think about great things that we can do. I think about the great works that a doctor does. Okay. I think about a lot of professions. I think about uh, the importance of, of farmers. I'm an agriculture teacher. And I have a passion for agriculture. Uh, I think about how important that is. There is no greater work than the salvation of souls. And what I've got to understand is I have an obligation, a duty, that whatever I do in life, whatever my job is, that somehow, some way, that I want to I want to be used by the Master's hand to influence people for good in a very humble way. Whatever, however the Lord can use me. And I think we need to be praying for those things and looking for opportunity. Because you know what I know? You know this too. I'm going to stand before God and give account in all of these things. And that gets my attention. Well, that brings us to the plea. Let's talk about the plea of the plan of salvation. What is the plea? What's the simple English word now? See, the great and compelling and urgent word of the Bible is now. And I love the way Paul puts it in 2 Corinthians 6 and verse 2 when he says, Behold, consider, now is the accepted time. Now is the day of salvation. You know, it's of interest to note that the practice of New Testament in New Testament times, after being convicted of their sins, those people never ate, slept, or drank until they obeyed the gospel of Jesus Christ. You know, you look at Acts 8 and the eunuch. I mean, that was an immediate thing. Here is water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? If you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, I do. They both went down into the water and came up out of the water. And the, and the eunuch went on his way rejoicing. Or I think about in Acts 16, the jailer. The Philippian jailer and his household. They were baptized when? Midnight. Midnight. Had someone call me uh, the other night. I do go to bed early, but uh, got to get up so early. And someone called me and said, so-and-so uh, wants to be baptized. Are you asleep? I said, yeah, but I'm up. I'm in a mess. Whatever time, I guarantee if someone needed to be baptized and you called uh, Jeff and his wife at 1 o'clock in the morning, buddy, he'd be out of that bed and gone to try to help that. Why? It's so important. It is so essential. It's so urgent, you see. It's too big a chance to, to, to take to put off baptism. Why is it so urgent? Why is it that it's so urgent that, that people obey the gospel now? Well, because too much time has already been wasted. Um, I baptized people up in their years. Uh, and they so wish that they not had waited so long. And they would tell you, don't you wait. Um, serve the Lord. Now. Now is the time. Another reason why it's so urgent uh, to do now is because, you know what? You never know. You might be rendered mentally or physically incapable. You might lapse into a coma because of an accident or something that happens. Uh, you may die. There's no promise of future. I know you know this. There's no promise of the next second. That's sobering. And we don't know when the Lord's coming. Uh, the second coming of Jesus. And, and, and all of those are important. Here's another important one. The more you put it off, the harder your heart may become. The harder your heart may become. Now that's serious. You know, uh, I, I've, I've seen people. I'm old enough. I'm 59 years old. And... I've talked to people, a younger man, where people say, yeah, I'm going to do it one day. I'm going to do it one day. I'm going to obey the gospel. And uh, maybe 20 years pass, and I still know those people. I say, when are you going to do it? I don't know. You know what happens in 20 years or whatever the time frame? The heart becomes more hard. And it's almost as if it's impossible for them to obey in a sense. In the sense that uh, because the heart has to be softened by the gospel. And I don't want to have such a callous heart against the gospel that I don't do what's right. That I don't save my soul. And so that's why this is an important point. The plea, don't put it off. Do it right now. And you will receive this last plea of salvation, the prize. What is the prize? Well, you know what the prize is. It's heaven. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 5 and verse 12, Rejoice 
and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven. Now, it's called a reward there. But in the word prize is used in 1 Corinthians 9.24 in the New King James Version. That's exactly right, talking about heaven. And so Jesus admonishes us about, about missing heaven. We don't want to do that. Like in Matthew chapter 6, verses 19 through 33. Uh, do, do not uh, prepare him by, uh, you know, we can seek the physical to such an extent that we neglect the spiritual. We can, we can overemphasize the physical. Listen, I know the physical is important. I mean, we are physical beings, not only physical beings. I've got to eat, I've got to work, I understand all those things. But that's not the most important thing. And it comes down to a matter of priorities. Jesus says in, in Matthew 6, 33, Seek ye first the kingdom of God, and all these things, and His righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. What things? It's talking about physical things. Listen, don't worry about those things. That's what Matthew 6, 19 through 33 is talking about. If you'll do what right, it'll all be good. It'll all be fine. I don't, that doesn't mean I don't have any problems or issues. But at the end of the day, it doesn't matter because I'm heaven bound. Now, because of the eternity of the soul, what will you have gained if you choose the physical pleasures of this life to the neglect of spiritual pleasures? What will you have gained? I think about Moses in Bible class this morning we talked about. That's what he saw. He saw the truth of that. Listen to what Jesus says in Matthew 16, 26. For what is a man profited if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? What shall a man give in exchange for his soul? Listen, if you're in this audience and you are in an unsafe condition, you are giving something for your soul right now. You've decided that there's something else more important than your spiritual welfare. You will miss heaven. The prize. No greater reward can be imagined. The greatest bliss, the greatest happiness. You know, you've heard preachers probably describe hell from the Bible. And, and I want you to understand something. I believe this with all of my heart. I believe that the Bible's description of hell is not as bad as it's going to be. I believe that what Bible writers do is give the most horrible language that possibly is in our human language and experiences to describe a place that actually is going to be worse. I believe that. And, and I believe the reverse of that as well. I believe, or the opposite of that, I believe also that Bible writers have done what's possibly humanly able through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit to get across to us the bliss, the blessings, the, the comfort, all of those things about heaven, and it still doesn't do it justice. I believe that. I don't believe that just because that sounds good and it's good to say. I believe that's what the Bible shows. The best, beautiful language that, that is in the human language Bible writers have chosen to describe heaven. Friends, it is better than that. I promise you. And I can't promise you a lot of things. But when God says it, I can promise you that because He's true. And so as I close, I would have you to do this. I would have you to make a decision. Let us admit the problem that yes, you're guilty of sin. Don't be in denial of it. Realize its consequences. Let us secondly believe and obey the person, Jesus Christ. And thus be led to comply with the plan so that we might enter the place, the church. And so we can begin working the greatest work in all the world, the purpose to seek and save that which is lost. So heed the plea now so that you might reap the prize. If you're not a child of God, we beg of you to value your soul. By believing that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. By repenting of your sins, Acts 2 and verse 38. By confessing Jesus before men, Romans 10 verse 10. By being immersed in water. Not that there's any uh, power in this water back here. There's no power in the water. The power is in compliance to God's commands. Understand that. And whenever someone goes down into the water, Romans 6, and comes up out of the water, a new creature... Those sins are gone. Those past sins are gone. And forgiveness takes place in the mind of God. And we believe it because God said it. Man, what a, a new creature indeed. You can begin a life dedicated to the greatest work in all, and that is the work of Jesus Christ and His mission. 
If you've done that, but maybe you've wandered away from God and not, not realized how you have just edged away little by little. And you look at yourself and you look at what the Bible says and how you're going to face those things that the Bible teaches. I promise you that God will forgive you indeed. He welcomes you back. His arms are open that you might return. If we can help you in any way, please come together. We stand and as we sing.